Good morning. Please uh, take a seat. Welcome. So I'm Bruce Usher, one of the two co-directors of the Tamer Center. It's beautiful to see all of you here in person. I want to begin with a thank you for our sponsors and the Tamer Center Advisory Board members who have made today's event possible, many of whom have been waiting several years now to celebrate Mona Sina and Andrea Turner Moffat since 2020. We appreciate the dedication of our supporters who are finally back with us today in person for this long-awaited celebration. In particular, I'd just like to call out a couple of individuals, extraordinary individuals who really support us along the way. Our honorary chairs for today's event, Russ and Cecily Carson, uh, Ravi Sinha, Shireen and Ahmed Taheb, Tayeb, excuse me, and Tony and Sandy Tamer. And Tony and Sandy in particular, I'd like to uh, call out your unparalleled vision and support, long-term commitment to the Tamer Center. So much has happened in the four years since we were last together in person. We moved the entire business school to a new campus. We have a new dean. The Tamer Center has a new co-director, my colleague Dan Wang, who you'll hear from in a few minutes. And we have a very large new initiative for the Tamer Center. And I just want to say a few words about that to get us started here this morning. But allow me to begin with a question to all of you. And that question is, since you graduated business school or college, what has been the one single thing that's had the greatest impact on business? And if you graduated any time when I did several decades ago, that, that question is actually pretty easy to answer. Is technology, specifically digital technology, has changed the world of business completely. It doesn't matter what industry you worked in, every business has changed, from finance to retail, transportation to industry. When I graduated from business school, the top five most valuable companies in the world, there was not a single tech company there. Today, four of the five most valuable companies are technology. That was the past. Let's look ahead now to the next couple decades and what's coming. My question for you is what's going to be the most impactful trend on business in the future? And I believe the answer to that question is climate change. And the reason for that is simply because the global economy, everything we've created in the last three centuries since the Industrial Revolution, it all emits greenhouse gases. And that worked pretty well for about 300 years. We created a decent standard of living for most of the world's population. The average human being today is 50 times as well off than the average human being pre-industrial revolution. But a global economy based on burning fossil fuels and emitting greenhouse gases, it's simply not sustainable. The world's climate scientists, many of them work at Columbia University, by the way, they make it clear that after several centuries of emitting greenhouse gases, we now have three decades to eliminate them, to reduce them to zero. After three centuries of economic growth, we now have three decades to completely rebuild our global economy. And that's what we're going to do. So what's this have to do with the Tamer Center? So the mission of the Tamer Center is to train, to train the next generation of business leaders to address the world's great social and environmental problems. And today's generation of business school students believe there's no greater challenge or more important challenge than climate change. And so the Tamer Center, we're rising to meet that challenge. 
we've designed an entirely new curriculum for the business school, a new academic curriculum with new courses. This coming academic year, we will have seven courses dedicated exclusively to climate change and business, five of which are entirely brand new courses. We're also incorporating climate change into the core. Six out of 10 of the core courses will cover climate change as well, and by next year, hopefully all 10 of them will. We're investing millions of dollars in climate and business research by our world-leading business school faculty. We're using experiential initiatives like the Three Karens Fellowship. We have a table of Three Karens Fellows with us today to learn a real-world experience in the sector. And we're creating a new climate practitioners network that you'll hear a little bit more about later today that I'm hoping some of you will join. So given this new focus, this new initiative of the Tamer Center on climate change, I can think of no better example of the caliber of our students working on this than this year's Carson Family Changemaker Award winner, Sylvia Gelonk Fernandez. The Carson Award is, is a recognition of current students who have demonstrated an outstanding commitment to leadership on social enterprise at the business school. Sylvia was one of my top students. She was a Three Karens Fellow. She worked with other students to really rally the dean around this issue of climate change and to rally the student leadership of the executive board on this topic. She will have an impact on our students for many years to come on this topic of climate change. So please join me in welcoming, congratulating Sylvia Glonk Fernandez. There you are. <laughs> challenging up here. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you very much, Professor Asher, for, for these kind words. Um, well, dear uh, fellow awardees, uh, guests today, members of the Tamer Center, and sponsors, I'm, I'm really honored to, to be receiving this, this award today. It's something special to me uh, that is close to heart. I think the class of 2023, we will uh, look back to our time at CBS and realize it was the time at which climate change uh, really became like front and center for, for businesses all around the world. And this has really shaped our, our experience here. It's been impressive to see how fast uh, CBS has pivoted to focus into this at a speed that normally we wouldn't, at least I wouldn't typically expect of the academic world. And it has been really uh, moving and, and special to, as a student, be, um, be lucky to, to be able to take a, a role on that. I, I think it's, it's unique how CBS has been able to enter a dialogue with its students and uh, make change become stronger, bigger, and, and faster together. Um, none of this work would have happened without my teammates, um, Roman Streloff and Danny Wagemans. It was a bit over a year ago that we were writing an open letter on climate action to, to Dean McLaren, and it's uh, shocking when I think of everything that has happened in between. He was uh, very, very receptive to, to the letter, I would say. Um, I also would like to give a special thanks to uh, Sandra Navali. I think <laughs> at this point she might be glad that we are graduating because we've <laughs> certainly abused her like time and kindness. She's always had an open door for us and she's always strengthened our initiatives with everything she, she knows about CBS, which is incredible. There's um, many other people that I would like to thank today that have been part of this journey and without whom this, um, all of the work that we've achieved this year would have not happened. But if I would mention all of them, we would probably be here until, until noon or sunset, who knows. 
And to me, that also kind of goes to show the thing that has been most special about uh, my time at CBS, which is that wherever you turn, there was always another student that was passionate about the things you were passionate about. But not only that, they were also willing to like roll up their sleeves and uh, make that change happen. I think that has been the finding of, of my time at CBS. So um, yes, I want to uh, thank everyone for, for this recognition again, the Tamer Center, Professor Asher, and congratulations to all the other honorees. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I have had the great pleasure of meeting many of you who have joined us today, and I'm really looking forward to meeting many of you, as many of you as I can in the rest of our time together here. My name is Dan Wong, uh, and along with Bruce, I'm one of the faculty co-directors of the Tamer Center. Uh, I've been in this position for about a year and a half, and this is my first awards breakfast, because when uh, Bruce and Ray and Sandra first approached me to join the Tamer Center, uh, we were in what I'd like to call the deep pandemic, um, which now seems like ages ago. Uh, I've been teaching at CBS for the past 10 years, and my areas of teaching are strategy and technology. Um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about mission critical decisions and also the future. And from that vantage point, I can tell you that without a doubt, the Tamer Center is mission critical to the business school and very much an essential part of the future of Columbia University and Columbia Business School. In fact, one of the special features of the Tamer Center is something that you might only appreciate if you come physically to campus every day. Uh, you see, all over Kravis and Geffen Halls, there are these TV monitors, and they display the campus events that day or that week. Uh, invariably, every other event is a Tamer Center event. Um, and chances are, uh, as our team knows all too well, that event is probably oversubscribed, standing room only. Um, and so I don't really know of any other center on campus that accomplishes as much as the Tamer Center does, and you are seeing so much of that pride and passion today in this room. But as I tell my students in strategy, um, you can't just say something without backing it up. So I'm gonna give you some numbers about this, if it's okay with all of you. So first is 14. So this represents now the full-time team members that we have at the Tamer Center. Um, and that makes us one of the largest centers on campus. Next is 50 and 100 million. This represents the 50 founders who have been supported through grants from the Tamer Center Social Venture Fund. And they, in turn, have raised over $100 million in investments since their founding on their own. And this year, I'm particularly excited to congratulate one of our most recent Tamer Fund recipients, Lacey Pierre, uh, who also just graduated on Sunday as well, uh, for her work with Wash House, which transforms laundromats to community innovation spaces. Okay, another number for you, 30. So this is the number of classes, total classes, that were taught in Columbia, in Columbia Business School's MBA and EMBA curriculums that relate to social enterprise, climate change, philanthropy, non and nonprofits. Um, not too long ago, I looked this up, that number was closer to five, uh, which just shows how far we've come. And I've been lucky enough to be a guest lecturer in many of these classes, and I have never seen higher student engagement on topics that relate to climate change and mass incarceration and the effects of social activism on business. Okay, um, 50 and 23. Uh, these are the 50 students who supported the 23 incredible nonprofit organizations in our nonprofit board leadership program, representing a variety of impact areas such as the arts, education, health, social justice, and more. Thank you so much to many in the room who contributed to that effort to make that possible. Um, and then finally, uh, 41. So these represent the 41 students who took part in this past spring's inaugural Inclusive Entrepreneurship Fellowship Program. Uh, the Inclusive Entrepreneurship Initiative is a new program that we started this past fall that has the goal of elevating access to entrepreneurial opportunities and resources for those who are systematically excluded from the economy, such as those who are formerly incarcerated, 
the disabled, and many immigrant groups. Uh, the overall mission of this effort is to create venture ecosystems that bridge social, digital, and economic divides. Uh, in fact, uh, the experience working with this program this past year is also what fills me with great pride uh, in what I'm about to do next, uh, which is to introduce our next speaker, who among any things to part in the Inclusive Entrepreneurship Program. So let me say a few words about Wilbert Carpenter, this year's student, one of this year's student recipients of the Carson Award. Um, I got to know Wilbert uh, because he sat in the first row of the core class that I teach, strategy formulation, in fall 2021, back in Eurus Hall. Uh, he didn't chose to sit there. The seats are randomly assigned. Um, but before business school, you should know that, that Wilbert used to work for TikTok, and I in my classes show a lot of TikTok videos. For those of you who graduated from business school a number of years ago, uh, let's just say that things about the MBA education have changed quite a bit. Anyway, immediately we clicked, uh, and since then I've had the pleasure of having Wilbur as a student in another class I teach on technology strategy, and, uh, and I got to know him well through many office hours, coffees, and hallway chats. Um, There's so many things that I admire about Wilbur, but let me just say that Wilbur's passion lies in creating an inclusive technology ecosystem by addressing the problems of bias and inequality that are unfortunately built into many of our everyday technology platforms and systems. Uh, I personally have learned so much from talking with Wilbur since he arrived at CBS two years ago, and I am sad to see him go, but, but you cannot get rid of us that easily, Wilbert. Uh, you will forever be part of the CBS and Tamer Center community. So please join me in congratulating this year's recipient of the Carson Award, one of our recipients, Wilbert. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, accepting this award from you is truly an honor. Um, your enduring support since the <laughs> very start of my CBS journey has really kept me going. Um, and I want to express my gratitude, not just for this recognition, but for everything that you do uh, for the Tamer Center and Columbia Business School. Um, I also want to give a special thanks to Sandra and Tony Tamer, uh, to Russell and Cecily Carson, uh, Bruce Usher, Ivy Hatson Gate, uh, and everyone else who's helped to make the Tamer Center what it is today. So as Dan mentioned before CBS, I had built a career in B2B marketing within media and technology. Um, however, I found myself persistently drawn to initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yet as I grew more engaged, I became increasingly disillusioned. Um, firsthand, uh, you know, despite the burgeoning DEI movement across corporate America, I saw the disconcerting gap between, re between rhetoric and reality. So I arrived at CBS with a clear objective, uh, to pivot into the field of ethical tech and responsible innovation. My aim was to explore how corporations' well-intentioned uh, initiatives to support marginalized communities could be better integrated into their long-term strategies. I saw business school as a chance to delve deeper into tech strategy, to understand what drives successful social impact initiatives, and to discern where I could best fit into this field. And so as I reflect now on the last two years, I was surprisingly able to achieve much of what I uh, had originally aimed for, largely due to the opportunities provided by the Tamer Center. Through the Inclusive Entrepreneurship Program, uh, the Social Enterprise Summer Fellowship, the Nonprofit Board Leadership Program, uh, and various Tamer Center courses, I was able to craft an MBA experience uh, that aligned with my very non-traditional uh, MBA aspirations. Um, however, uh, accepting this award is not without some internal conflict. Uh, throughout each Tamer Center program, I found myself yearning to have wanting to make a greater impact. But I'm reminded that the problems addressed by social enterprises are pervasive, complex issues that are deeply rooted in society. The scope of these challenges can make any effort to affect change seem impossible. 
it can lead one to question whether their energy could be more fruitfully applied elsewhere. Um, and I imagine that some of you may share those same sentiments. Uh, yet, being surrounded by individuals like all of you keeps me focused, motivated, and reassured to continue along this path. And while I'm nowhere close to solving you know, global inequality, um, I firmly believe that each small step helps to build a better world. And so for all of you here who are already doing the work, I encourage you to continue taking the incremental steps and continue to support one another on this journey. Uh, whether our individual impact is large or small, everyone here has something incredibly valuable to contribute. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Wilbert. Uh, I am not done yet because it has been a few years since we've done this in person, and that means we did not get to honor the student recipients of the Carson Changemaker Award during the time that we were all remote and virtual. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to also recognize three recent graduates who were the recipients of the Carson Changemaker Award back in 2020. Um, those three recipients are sitting right there. Um, uh, uh, let me introduce each of them in turn. Uh, Kyle Fink, uh, who uh, I also had the pleasure of teaching in, in strategy, uh, was integral to planning the Social Enterprise Conference as well as co-leading diversity, equity, and inclusion at CBS through leadership in the student government and participating in a variety of social enterprise courses. Natasha Gabe, who I also had as a student in strategy, uh, was an active co participant in so many of our programs, uh, including co-planning the Social Enterprise Conference. While at CBS, Natasha interned at Nova Credit, a financial technology company that empowers immigrants to transfer and use their foreign credit history in the United States. And then finally, there's Meg Johnson, who I regret not having in strategy formulation, um, applied her skills uh, and commitment as an educator across programs, including participating in the first trip to Alabama with our innovative Bridging the American Divides course, which is led by, by Bruce. Uh, so please join me in, in congratulating them on this award. So let me just say that, that after graduation, all three have remained dedicated to social impact. Kyle volunteers for a nonprofit supporting journalism, uh, education for high school students. Uh, Meg serves on the board of a financial aid uh, fund for a summer camp, um, in addition to her full-time role in education as well. And of course, Natasha is applying her consulting skills to high-impact pro bono casework, including projects for the Robin Hood Foundation's Blue Ridge Labs and volunteer work uh, with Well Constructed, a nonprofit that builds and maintains wells in Ghana. So you can clearly see the impact that the Tamer Center has for not just the short term, but also the long term for many of our alums as well. For the next portion of our um, program, what I'd like to do is invite the newest member of our Tamer Center team, Allison Klein, who many of you know very well um, as the organizer of this event. Let me just also say that Allison is a recent grad of our executive MBA uh, program. I have gotten to know her very well in her uh, few months here at the Tamer Center. She has been such a valuable team member as well. And Allison, in her time at CBS, also had quite extensive experience with Tamer Center activity. So I'd love to invite her to talk about her involvement uh, with our um, uh, justice, uh, our, our, our re-entry program um, and, and other activities as well. And she's gonna help us um, kind of with an interactive portion of this session. So, Allison. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's so nice to see everyone in person, finally, um, after I think probably hundreds of emails, so I apologize for that. Um, so as Dan said, uh, before I joined the Tamer Center team as a staff member, um, I knew the Tamer Center well um, through the Reentry Acceleration Program. Um, it was a highlight of my time as a student here. 
Um, and I was originally signed up to teach entrepreneurship in spring of 2020 at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, a maximum security men's facility in Ossining. Um, and I was really lucky in that I signed up to teach the first couple of weeks of the term uh, in February and um, March 1st of 2020. So I was able to, to get a good amount of in-person teaching experience in before we unfortunately had to pause the program um, for in-person teaching. Um, it was disappointing not to be able to finish out the term with our students at the time. So when Sandra reached out a couple of years later and said we were just cleared to go back into the facility, um, and we needed alumni volunteers who had already been fingerprinted and approved uh, and been through the whole orientation process to get started in time. Um, it was a very easy, um, easy decision for me. Um, so just about two years to the day after my first Saturday teaching, um, I was back at Sing Sing with Sandra on the second floor of the school building. Uh, she was in one classroom, I was in the other to maintain their social distancing requirements. Um, so, between the social distancing and the masks, there were a lot of things that had changed in those two years. Um, one thing that hadn't was the students. Most of our original students from that uh, entrepreneurship class uh, from 2020 were back and still dedicated to the coursework um, and wanted to complete the term. Um, starting over meant that we were able to redo our first lesson of the term, which uh, much like in the EMBA program at least, is the values hierarchy lesson. Uh, so you get to think through what your values as an individual and a leader are, um, and reflect on how those values help you make decisions. Um, one of the students in class in February 2022 still had his original notes uh, and was able to share with us that the value that hadn't made it uh, even to his top five originally um, but was his core value two years later was service. So he was um, knew without a doubt after those two years that his highest priority was to serve his community. And that became kind of a theme throughout the term. Uh, by our final day of class, um, the entrepreneurship pitch presentations, I think almost every person in that class presented something that was grounded in the idea of service. So whether that was a nonprofit after school program um, that one student proposed because he wished he had had access to something similar uh, growing up uh, or something with a more of a for-profit structure, um, like one car repair business, uh, but that would focus on hiring and training other formerly incarcerated employees. The most memorable presentation was one that um, we didn't get to see in the classroom um, because one of our students from that 2020 cohort uh, wrote, uh, he had written in his initial application that the business he wanted to work on with us was a nonprofit for New York City youth. And by April of 2022, he was no longer at Sing Sing. He was no longer in the classroom with us. Um, he had just started a new role as a program officer at a major national foundation where he now makes decisions every day about grant-making dollars uh, to support exactly the kinds of organizations he had envisioned working on. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I can possibly do justice to his story and who he is a, as a leader. Um, his name is Jermaine Archer. He has an amazing uh, TED Talk on YouTube if you'd like to hear from him directly because it is much better than anything I'm going to say today. Um, I also can't do justice to all of the other students we've seen um, at Sing Sing over the years, but I can't wait for the day that hopefully we see more of their business ideas and visions having an impact on their communities um, and in our lives. Uh, and I can't wait for what the Tamer Center does next, because it feels like every day there is a new, um, something new and amazing happening. Uh, we're returning to a women's facility um, to teach in the fall again for the first time since before the pandemic, uh, teaching personal finance and uh, financial empowerment. Um, and there are just so many other things happening in REAP and Justice Through Code and in all of our programs every day. Um, so it's an honor to be um, playing just a small part in this work. Um, it's an honor to be here with all of you who have already been so generous in so many ways. 
been generous with your time this morning, certainly. Um, so I can't wait to see what this group can accomplish next. So um, we have a, a technology expert as a faculty co-director, so I'm going to let him explain this next. It's really only the, the <laughs> only reason why I'm here, which is to direct your attention to your program, uh, because you've noticed that uh, right below, um, right in the middle of the, of, the, of the program, there's a QR code. Um, and we're going to take a short um, a, a break before uh, Bruce comes back up here. Um, and uh, if, if you will, during this break, I'd like everyone to, to scan the QR code. How you do that, if you have an iPhone, <laughs> if you haven't done this, you just click your camera like this, you aim it, and then you wait for it to get into focus. This is something I have to say, believe it or not, a lot at Columbia Business School. <laughs> Um, if you tap on the QR code, it'll s and, and a, a link should pop up. If you go to it, it'll take you to an interactive survey. Um, and it will ask you to ponder how you might be involved in the Tamer Center um, as well. So we're going to be back after a few minutes while I let folks uh, do this. Any technical difficulties, I'm sitting at table eight. So just let me know. All right. Thank you. We'll be back, back in a few minutes. Please uh, take a seat and we'll start the second half of our program. If, uh, if I could have your attention. <laughs> Clearly, everyone's enjoying being back together in person. Lots of good conversation. All right. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Andrea Turner Moffat, the winner of this year's Leadership Award. <laughs> Andrea has long been committed to women's leadership through investing. She co-founded Plum Alley, a venture finance platform that finances gender diverse entrepreneurial teams. Andrea's book, Harness the Power of the Purse, Winning Women Investors, her global study on, women's investor, on women investors while at the Center for Talent Innovation and her venture firm have had real impact on many people, including some in the room today. Shannon Bauer, who I believe is with us today, informed us, and I quote, the call to action in Andrea's book and the mission with which she co-founded Plum Alley Investments motivated me to personally invest behind women founders building companies. Another one of, uh, uh, another person wrote to us, Denise Gibson, about Andrea. Her quote was much shorter about Andrea's impact on her own fund, quote, Andrea was the bolt of inspirational lightning, unquote. And on a personal note, as Andrea's former professor, it's incredibly gratifying to watch a former student go out into the world and make it a better place. Andrea has done just that. Please join me in congratulating Andrea Turner Moffitt.
Thank you, Bruce. This is really an incredible honor, and especially receiving this award from you. I'd like to first recognize the Carson Student Changemakers. You are all really why we are here this morning. In a world full of negative headlines, from natural disasters and war, to homelessness and human rights violations, your optimism and relentless drive are infectious. We should all be grateful for the Tamer Center has created an incredible program, anchored in a robust curriculum and wrapped with impactful student experiences that create a kinetic energy permeating across the school and beyond. An energy I hope alumni who may not have been as close to Tamer over the last few years can appreciate today. I've been reflecting on my experience at CBS more than 15 years ago. The social enterprise program was formative and growing influence, but nothing like what it is today. Tamer's expansion has coincided with transformation in the business world. As we strive towards a more enlightened capitalism to benefit not just shareholders, but stakeholders, while accounting for environmental and societal impact. To give a little context, when I was on campus back in 2005, ESG investing wasn't, was basically non-existent. In the last almost 20 years, we've surpassed 40 trillion of assets under management in ESG investing. In the venture world for women founders where I live, in 2008, and there was a meager 2.3 billion invested in women entrepreneurs. That's increased to over 40 billion last year. The kernel of these ideas may not have been as radical as they were in the 80s and 90s, but they still felt very much on the frontier in early in my career. I'd like for a moment just to take you to a time just after 9-11. We'd invaded Afghanistan and I had just spent the last two years living the rise and fall of the dot-com bubble as a tech investment banker. It was an incredible learning experience, but one that felt devoid of something I couldn't quite pinpoint. That spring of 2002, I was moving from Boston to New York City at the request of my husband, which worked out. And I started interviewing for jobs, the first of which was an SRI mutual fund at Solomon Smith Barney. I ultimately didn't take the job because screening companies through a negative lens felt a little too narrow for me. So I jumped into the world of microfinance. I was super pumped about an opportunity to work with the leadership at Women's World Banking, who were rapidly expanding microloans to women entrepreneurs around the world. You can imagine my devastation when I was passed over for the opportunity. I got a call from one of the executives who gave me a glowing review of my capabilities. And then she said, Andrea, I'm not convinced you're cut out for the nonprofit world. I think you'll be better suited staying in the private sector and forging your way to have an impact in, in, in business. I was got wrenchingly devastated. But that, without that experience, I probably would not have come to Columbia Business School. When I finally arrived on campus, I was drinking from a fire hose, going to every club meetup possible, from private equity and venture, even consulting. Finally, I found the social enterprise program. I'd found my home. It was truly my tribe. They understood my language, the conversations and the courses made my heart beat fast. One of my most influential courses was taking Professor Usher's finance and sustainability class. It provided an insightful and yet practical framework for how to use capital markets and private markets for societal and environmental impact, something I've been longing for for years. While I was at CBS, I also worked with a think tank to create a prototype for what we called a women's value index, 
we rated public companies on the basis of gender metrics. Seemed very novel at the time. I fondly remember sitting with Professor Ray Horton's office midway through my second year debating whether I should try to commercialize the index or take an offer from Citi to do project finance. Since I had hefty loans, pragmatism won out and I landed at Citi doing development finance in Latin America for many years. But I watched with envy as ESG and impact investing began to take off. The GIN, Generation Investment Management, and many others. I also became relentlessly passionate about gender equity. This led me to partner with the same think tank to underwrite not an index, but this time a global study and ultimately a book to ignite a global conversation about the opportunity for women to expand their influence as investors. Having watched the world through the lens of capital markets, I was adamant we had to diversify those, who, those perspectives and bring more diverse perspectives into how we were deploying capital, both professionally and personally. This led me full circle to venture investing in early stage companies. It's been an incredible seven years building a mission-driven venture investing firm, Plumelli Investments, alongside a fellow CBS alum, Deborah Jackson, who shared my con conviction for championing women investors and women founders. We've now invested in over 30 companies and over 75 million, all in gender diverse founded teams building impact driven technology and healthcare companies. I'm honored to have two dear friends, Shannon Bauer, who you heard about, who is actually a cluster mate of mine at CBS, and Nina Tandon, who's a fellow Columbia Business School alum, and also the founder and CEO of Epibone. A few years ago, we took a group of investors to Brooklyn, to Epibone's lab, and I think actually maybe Joni and Mona, you're there, along with Shannon, and Nina and her Epibone team shared with us their groundbreaking scientific advancements to grow bone from your very own stem cells. This novel medical breakthrough actually was incubated at Columbia and spun out into a company. What's so special about this story is that Shannon was able to invest in EpiBone through Pomali. And it's particularly meaningful as Shannon's daughter had survived a, a rare bone cancer at an early age. One of the most meaningful investments for me personally, of course they all are meaningful, was a company called Interplant that we invested in last year. This is a climate tech company that is embedding sensors in seeds so that plants can talk to farmers, enabling them to use less chemicals and water irrigation. My father, who grew up on a farm in central Illinois, he was so proud to be here today. He passed away in 2019 of multiple myeloma. And this is a cancer that is linked to Monsanto's Roundup Ready weed killer, which was used on corn and soybean farms for many decades. These are just two of so many inspiring founders using technology and science to tackle everything from climate change and sustainable industry to health and building more equitable economies. I'm confident many of the next generation of entrepreneurs are in this very room today. As I look ahead, I'm invigorated by the momentum underway, both building early stage companies and transforming established institutions to create world positive outcomes takes leadership with conviction, investors with unwavering commitment, and talent that is resilient in the face of endless obstacles. The Tamer Center is preparing the next generation through a burgeoning programs and curriculum in climate, inclusive entrepreneurship, prison reform, which you heard about, nonprofit board leadership, and in so many various ways that have been talked about today. 
I am so proud as an alum of Columbia Business School for the leadership the school has shown to continue to drive change in business, society, and the environment. I'd like to personally recognize Professor Ray Horton for being a pioneer and building the foundational tenets of the Tamer Center. And for Bruce Usher for leading us in, through an expansion over the last decade, and now in partnership with Dan Wang, who you've heard from. And I additionally like to thank Sandra Navalli for your steadfast leadership, also mentioned today, to counsel students and alumni who are on the ground in social enterprise field building. And finally, I'd like to thank the Tamers and the entire board for your vision, your long-term vision seeing the impact the center could have in business school, in Columbia, in New York City, and the world. And I'd like to recognize my fellow honoree, Mona Sinha, who's been a personal inspiration. You are a warrior for women's rights and for believing and actually investing in women entrepreneurs and women investors. And, <clears throat> and finally, I want to thank my family, my husband Steve, who has been on this journey with me for more than two decades, my mom, who instilled in me the importance of making a difference in the world, my friends who cheered me on, and my children who inspire me to use my time wisely to create a better world for the next generation, more than a few who hopefully will be Tamer alums too. And in closing, I invite all of you to consider, in small or increasingly big ways, what new intentional commitments you can make with your time, with your capital, with your talents, to have a world positive impact in your investments, in your businesses, your schools, your nonprofits, and our shared community. Thank you. Congratulations again, Andrew. Please join me in welcoming Tony Tamer up to the podium. Good morning. I have to start by saying it is so nice to see so many friends and supporters. And I've got to say, I am so surprised so many are willing to wake up so early. <laughs> and I personally know some of you, I'm not gonna name names, who I know really dislike getting up early. <laughs> but the good news is despite disliking waking up early, despite having to hear all of these speeches, when I see that my friend, Tom Willem, hasn't joined once, I know this is going well. <laughs> it's going well, right? Let me, on a more serious note, uh, also take the opportunity to highlight the incredible contributions of the leadership team at the Tamer Center. Uh, the two co-heads, Dan Wang, Bruce Usher, the incredible Sandra Navalli, the entire faculty, the staff, you guys are doing an incredible amount of work, such a wide ranging number of initiatives that you've launched. You've heard so much about so many, but there are many more. You've heard about climate change, but we've got the loan assistance program, the venture fund that seeds social entrepreneurs, the inclusive entrepreneurship, and so on and so forth. So once more, please join me in giving a big round of applause <laughs> to these guys. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the recipient of the 2023 Horton Award for Excellence in Social Enterprise, none other than Mona Sinha. <laughs> Mona, I cannot tell you what an honor and pleasure it is to present you with this award, which is an award that is overdue. Uh, you've heard before, this is an award we had presented in 2020 uh, of course had to cancel because of COVID. 
but I'm so thrilled that we're here now that I can tell you why Mona is so deserving of this award and so much more. Mona's track record is truly outstanding. Over the past few years, Mona has raised more than a billion dollars to fund a large number of projects and initiatives, grassroots movements, and supported over 90 organizations for the purpose of unlocking the potential of women all over the world through legal equality and economic empowerment. Mona is unstoppable. The past January, she took on the role as global executive director of Equality Now, a global organization which promotes legal change and the power of the law to create enduring equality for women and girls everywhere. Mona is also the board chair of Women Moving Millions. In addition, she serves on the executive council of the Smithsonian American Women's History Museum and many more accomplishments that we could possibly list today. And of course, Mona's track record includes over a decade of leadership within Columbia University, including, of course, a pivotal role on the advisory board of the Tamer Center, and her many speaking appearances, sharing her expertise and inspiring the next generation of students and future leaders. Mona's recent New Year's role at Equality Now as Global Executive Director is custom made for Mona. Her network and impact are global and the outpouring of support from so many friends and colleagues around the world is a testament to why this is the right time and right role for her. Mona, while today's in-person audience is just a fraction of the global network that is grateful for your leadership. We are proud to have an opportunity to applaud all that you've done. And so I am honored to present you with the 2023 Horton Award for Excellence in Social Enterprise. Please join me in congratulating them. morning. Thank you, Tony, for that very warm introduction. I'm delighted to be here, even if it's after a three-year hiatus, because during that time, the world has changed in so many ways that we are only now beginning to figure out. It's really quite something to stand here as the relatively new head of equality now. I had no vision for this when I was at Columbia Business School, because in the 1990s, I know that's uh, a long time ago. Gender equality and justice frameworks were not something we were encouraged to consider as business models. Today, the Tema Center shines a light on the interconnectedness between business and society and equality. And I really now enjoy saying when people ask me, what do you do? I say, I'm in the business of equality. Honestly, for all that my career has been, this has been the most fun I'm having. To be recognized by the Tema Center, whose work I've long admired and supported, is really very, very special. I thank you for the vision, Ray, when you started the nonprofit leadership program decades before anyone was thinking about it. Thank you to Bruce and Dan for leading this extraordinary group of people, and Sand Sandra, always, for your steadfast leadership of the Tema Center. And of course, I'd be remiss not to recognize Tony and Sandra's vision in knowing that the Tema Center was gonna be a force in the world, so thank you for naming it. It's very special to share this occasion with Andrea. Andrea, thank you for your leadership in investing in women entrepreneurs, and I'm really proud to be an investor in Plum Alley. As we all know, no work worth doing is ever easy, but it's been well documented that women's work and I don't mean roles routinely relegated to women, but rather any work that women truly step in to do is inevitably shaped by the many layers of inequalities and challenges that they have to choose to face and that define their lives. Today's broad picture regards to gender equality and the status of women across the world brings to mind 
um, an old saying which I'm sure you're all familiar with, the truth will set you free. We do ourselves no favors in denying or airbrushing the realities that many women face around the world. If we don't face and acknowledge the truth about the status of women and how this impacts all of humanity, including men, we won't make sustainable progress. Not in technology, where Andrea mentioned that women still receive only 3% of venture funding, where I was really disappointed to see only four women standing in a sea of hundreds of men at COP27. We were talking about climate justice. Not in education, where women are 70% of the students, yet represent only 30% of academic leadership. And I was shocked to learn that automakers only started experimenting safety equipment on women's bodies in 2022. The truth about gender equality globally and at home is currently as upsetting as it is encouraging, because no matter where you look, there's been tremendous progress made, but we still have a lot of work to do. As my friend Gloria Steinem says, the truth will set you free, but first, it'll piss you off. <laughs> but there was a moment of light. The pandemic, um, for as long as I can remember, raised a global understanding of the realities that women face. We all heard in the media stories about how the burden of the pandemic fell in, in much more severe ways on women who quit their jobs, who had to stay home, make a choice between childcare and going to work. But today, that burden of school closures and childcare has actually been estimated at $300,000 over a lifetime. And in America, with no federally mandated paid family leave and constitutional right to health care or to their own bodies, frankly, women receive worse health care here than in many parts of the world, accompanied by a price tag that many can't even afford. And you might be surprised at this, but women globally around the world only have three quarters of the legal rights of men. That means today, 2.4 billion women of working age do not have the same legal rights as men. And to be clear, that's not just somewhere out there. It's actually right here in our own country. Men continue to be paid in the US 27% more than women are for the same exact work. And as we are starting to look at the pandemic in the rearview mirror, the short focus of women and their role as equal contributors, multitasking while caring for the elderly and for their children, but also creating $1 billion venture funds has become yesterday's news. The media has moved on to discuss inflation and interest rates. Let's keep focus and put some pressure on them to stay with the stories. How can we be surprised by the fact that only 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women, 28% of corporate board seats are held by women, and where women holding barely a quarter of all congressional seats is actually considered a record. Equality Now and our partners are right there with women to make change happen. We believe that gender equality is a core characteristic of any fully functioning society. Our organization's commitment to the global equality movement over the last 30 years has not wavered. In fact, it's only deepened as women throughout the world have shouldered the unfair share of the pandemic's disruptive burdens. And I'm proud to say it's modeled by men and women. For more than three decades, the importance of our work has been unwavering and important as we imagine a world where everyone enjoys equal rights, freedoms, and respect regardless of their gender or intersectional identities. And we are relentless in our pursuit of it. We believe that if we have strong gender equal laws around the world, the rest will follow, because legal equality is a linchpin to gender equality. So we combine our legal expertise with advocacy, constructive collaboration. We work in coalitions around the world so that we can lift the voices of those who actually experience the problems firsthand. So we create change across four primary areas, ending legal equality such as those rooted in family and religious laws, ending sexual violence such as honor killings, incest, and rape, ending sexual exploitation such as trafficking, both in the physical world and now growing in the digital world, and ending harmful practices such as child marriage and female genital mutilation. Did you know that in the United States there are only eight states 
that legally require girls to be 18 years old when they get married. So you may ask, what does this have to do with business? Well, think about it. Women who are forced to deal with many of the issues I just spoke about and deal with so many unequal laws in the world that do not protect them, they are not able to engage in work or society in fundamentally positive and full ways. And violence, by the way, is a multi-billion dollar industry. I know you've never thought of violence in that way, but it really is an industry. The sex trade, for one, is $180 billion. And it's second only to the arms trade controlled by powerful people, which can explain why it's so hard to end and find economic alternatives for women that do not result in bodily harm. Meanwhile, laws that enable equal futures have great benefits. Greater engagement of women in society and the workplace allows for organizations to consider a full range of perspectives and experiences, leading to a better understanding of their customers and better decisions. For example, in the climate movement, indigenous women who represent only 5% of the population, yet they care for over 75% of biodiversity, can help us find the best solutions. Gender equal laws can help businesses and their leaders mitigate legal and reputational risks. I mean, think about this. If Goldman Sachs could have had greater transparency and pay equity, it may have saved them $215 million. Eliminating discriminatory practices to shape an inclusive workplace around aligned values, we know, helps attract and retain top talent, increase productivity, and build employee morale. I could go on and on, but the bottom line is this. Equality is an imperative that needs both men and women as champions. In business, as in life, treating every human being with dignity and respect is simply the right thing to do. Without it, individuals can't thrive, and by extension, businesses can't either. Despite the clear data supporting this work, it really is an uphill battle. Equality now has won some sweeping victories in the last 30 years and has successfully changed or transformed about 70 laws around the world, including one just recently. And I share this with you as an example of the work that we're engaged in every day. In this, ja this January, just as I started, I took it as a good omen. A young Bolivian woman called Brisa de Angulo and her legal team scored a stunning win at the Inter-American Court of Law, which made it a landmark ruling in her favor. At 15, she was raped repeatedly by an adult cousin, threatened and brainwashed into believing that if she revealed what was happening, only more damage and harm would come to her and her family. When she finally talked to her therapist, her efforts to seek justice were thwarted by the courts, and her case was thrown out three times. Brisa's experience in Bolivia was typical of the struggle that adolescent girls of sexual violence face across Latin America, the Caribbean, and North America. Bolivia has the highest rate of sexual violence in the region, with 70% of Bolivian women experiencing physical or sexual abuse in their lifetime, a third before the age of 18. Yet only 2% conviction rate makes this something that you know, men practice with impunity. With an explosion of the digital space, we are seeing sexual violence growing disproportionately and uncontrollably in this area as well. When Equality Now joined Brisa's team in 2014, we knew this case was important and that the impact of it would extend far beyond her and her family. From the moment she reported her rapist, the system tried to shame her and silence her. In addition to holding her perpetrator to account, we knew we also had to hold Bolivia to account. In the decade that Equality Now worked on this case, and yes, it took over a decade to get justice, several submissions were made to the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. We organized a group of experts who were instrumental in supporting the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women to create a model law on consent. The breakthrough came in January. The court ruled in Brisa's favor, finding that Bolivia violated her human rights and subjected her to cruel, inhumane, and degrading treatment by judicial personnel. The ruling stipulated a requirement for Bolivia to publicly acknowledge its culpability and to implement numerous legal and procedural changes. Brisa bravely endured a nightmare, the likes of us many are never going to see. But this ruling was a dream come true. 
because the court saw fit more than just to change the law. It demanded to create an infrastructure for a culture shift that will transcend Bolivia to impact the entire region. Despite such highlights, and there are few, global progress towards gender equality in the law has decelerated in almost 20 years. Today, the UN estimates that at the current funding rate of 1.9% of all philanthropic dollars going to women and girls, it's going to take 300 years for us to reach a gender equal world. That number two years ago was 132 years. So we can't let this stand. We won't let this stand. To do so would not only be counterproductive to the global political and economic stability of our world, but it would also be patently unconscionable. To put it in terms best suited for our gathering here today, denying women legal rights is incredibly bad business. In fact, any inequality is bad business. So where's the good news? We do have good news. Mostly it comes in the form of opportunity, which is all around us. For starters, there are some big opportunities coming up in 2023 for governments to support each other in making positive changes. Already we are seeing in Latin America, advocates who are watching Brisa's case are using the ruling to push their own governments to change the laws. Properly implemented, Brisa's ruling will create transformational, sustainable change for millions and millions of women and girls, not just in Latin America, but around the world. And we're seeing many companies and corporates step up um, and investing in this change as well. This year in the United States, we will also mark the 100 year anniversary of the introduction of the Equal Rights Amendment. For those of you who think it's yesterday's news, it really isn't. Because the laws that we saw changing the Roe versus Wade decision could not have happened if we had the ERA in our constitution. When we examine how the law translates into everyday life, we see that meaningful lived experience comes through cultural change, which is rooted in the law. This can often mean difficult conversations across divisive lines, with family, as we navigate the complexity of religion, of tradition, of community values. We understand that wherever we are, and whatever we, we are speak, wherever we're speaking from, power is rooted in who we're listening to. So we each have the power to connect with others and share our views. At the same time, we know that those who are in the closest proximity to problems are often the ones that find the best solutions. Changing this means elevating the voices of women and girls around the world on whose life the impact of inequality has historically been most profound. Women like Brisa. This takes tenacity and courage and resources. It'll take all people of every background, race, gender, in every corner of the world, and in every sector of business to make it their business to do more than care about equality and actually to act. There's room for every one of you to step in, engage in and make meaningful change. The business of gender equality is bigger than any one person, any one organization, any one Columbia Business School, any one sector or any one spot on the earth. Equality Now's mission to deliver gender equality through legal change can be easy to overcomplicate or oversimplify, but the truth is it has to be done. Inequality is arguably our greatest impediment to solving the problems that will define our future. This is why equality is my business, and this is why I invite you to make it yours. It is serious business, but honestly, that's why every single win is more thrilling than the one before. As the leader of equality now, I'm really humbled and honored to be recognized for this work. The greatest acknowledgement you can give would be to join us on the next phase of our journey towards a more just and equal world for everyone. In fact, as we leave here today, proud beneficiaries and stewards of this incredible school of business, I hope you'll ask yourself, if we're not about the business of achieving equality through the world, how can we credibly assert to be at the very center of business? The answer for me is we can't. So please help us to continue advancing this work. It's the great unfinished work of the world, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share it with you today.
Well, I, I don't think I can follow that. Um, so I will just say briefly, um, thank you again for coming. Thanks to the more than 30 of you who have already filled out the call to action. Um, we will leave that survey open for the rest of the day for anyone else who would still like to join us. Um, and we've thanked a lot of people today, two names we haven't heard yet, uh, my amazing colleagues, Diana Rambo and Hannah Slow, who have done such incredible work um, helping to put this event together. And I think that is, that is all for me. Uh, so thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.